Well, now, in the final program of the People's History series, Billy Kay presents Andy and Harry's War. <laughs> The Japanese regarded us as, as nothing. We were nothing, because we had capitulated. The prisoners of war, to get on these ships, had to be able to walk or crawl on. And they were skin and bone. They had no hair, whatever. Some of them were like walking skeletons. Their ribs were sticking out everywhere. They just were a bag of bones, a rush of bones, as my granny would call them. You can't hold hate against people. You can't do that. It's bad for you. It's really, really bad for you, you know. The only time I hate was when a horse gets beat by a short head, you know. Andy Coogan from Glasgow, whose sense of humour helped him fool the death camps as a Japanese prisoner of war. And Harry Duff is from Dundee, who went to Vancouver Island to receive and process the poor souls who had survived the camps and were on the way home to families who had no idea if they were dead or alive. Andy's story, though, begins in the environment that shaped his character, the teeming streets of the Gorbals in the 1920s and 30s. As a boy in the Garbles, our main pastimes was playing football in the street from one lamppost to another. This particular day, I was just about 16 at the time, and up goes one of the windows in the time. She said, look, the hurdler's coming across the dike. She said, watch yourself, lads. The hurdler was a policeman, you see, and he came from the hospital street, and he jumped the dikes and come out Thistle Street, and he used to get funny chasing the catch, you know, and he's got me across the years with his gloves or that. But this particular day, he came, and at the end of the street was Joke Scott, a policeman. And I, I seen Joke Scott, but I didn't know what close this hurdler was coming out, you know. And he did come out eventually. And stood he catching the nearest man, a tall boy, a tall, he made for me. And I said, I couldn't understand this, because you could have caught anybody else. So I turned and I said, right, Lord, you've picked them up and I'll put them down. I, got, I started running, and he started chasing me, catch me, you know. Then I started to go like hell, you know, and I went and left him. The hurdler didn't stand a chance. Andy had recently been fined half a crown for playing on a Sunday, and his mammy couldn't afford any Mary's nonsense. He was terror-struck then, when there was a chap at the door, and he opened it to confront the other policeman, Scott, asking to see his mammy. Instead of the expected reprimand, however, Scott announced that he was taking Andy up to join the famous athletics club, the Mary Hill Harriers, and there was a wee inducement to encourage him. Before we do it, he opened up his two attention note and he put it on the table. He says, there you are. He says, what's that for? He said, I had a bet with a hurdler, he wouldn't he catch your boy. <laughs> That's exactly what he said. He said, when he catch your boy, because I've tried to catch him. By the late 1930s, Andy became one of Scotland's best milers, winning the Hamden and Ibrox miles in front of the huge crowds that flocked to athletics meetings in those days. His greatest test, though, was at the Ibrox Invitation Mile in 1940, when his main opponent would be Sidney Wooderson, the world champion. There was a wee problem, though. By then, he had joined up with the Lanarkshire sir Yeomanry, was stationed at Edinburgh's Redford Barracks, and he didn't have a weekend pass. So what does a gala's Gorbals boy do? He does a runner on the Saturday morning and gets lucky when his first lift tells him the purpose of his journey. I'm going to see this race with Wooderson. I must see this race. I said, will you take me to Ibrox too, sir? He says, aye. Sure, you, you want to see the race? I said, I I'm in the race. <laughs> the man looked at me, you know, honestly, God, he never said another word to me. I think he thought I was a bit of a nutcase. <laughs> they arrived with an hour to spare. Andy got stripped and went out for his warm-up. Everybody started to cheer me, cheer me like hell, you know. And I'm like, hey, what's going on? They mistook me for Sidney Wooderson, because I very like him. They mistook me for him. He was a world record holder, four minutes, eight seconds. Andy has a newspaper photograph of the race, which he would carry with him right through the war. 90,000 people watching, and guess who's out in front? 150 hours to go. I made my break. But you must be about, what, 15 yards ahead of him here? I would say 10. But he passed me, he was a wonderful man. I, was, I felt honoured to be running against that man, I really did. So that was the story. He caught me on the tape, you know. No shame in that, and he'd be as happy as Larry as long as he could get back to barracks with impunity. 
So I stayed the night in Glasgow. The Malaysian and Redford Barracks covered up my bed for me. They got away with it. Well, they did. But Andy didn't he? And the Monday, this bombardier came up, this English bombardier, army daft. He said, Coogan, you're on a charge. She what for? You are out of bounds on Saturday without a pass. I said, you're talking about a type. I've been here. I wasn't out of bounds on Saturday. What are you talking about? Now, I can't argue with him, you know. Wait a minute, it's just, it shows the newspaper. Andy Coogan takes the lead 150 yards to go to Ibrox Mile. Oh, Christ. The boys burst. The boys burst, you know. Ten days confined to barracks and no pay. Hard going at the time, but heaven compared to what awaited him just over a year later after the fall of Singapore to Japan and the capitulation of the Allied troops early in 1942. His first march as a POW established a pattern of behaviour by the Japanese guards that would last the rest of the war. The belly was sticks and everything. You know. I mean, the, the butt of rifles, you know, I got my teeth all broken. Look at my nose. That was the butt of a rifle. The nose was almost like that. At least it's excuses. So you're only walking fast enough, you can get the butt of the rifle in your back. And some of the lads had blood run down the back of their shirts and everything. In conditions that recalled the slave ships of the Middle Passage, Andy was transported on hell ships like the Lisbon Maru to Formosa, where he experienced his first camp. In Kasaki Hell Camp. And I'll tell you something, that was the most horrible place I ever lived in. The water had actually drained off the roofs of the huts and we're drinking it. And we shouldn't have done that because there were dead rats in it. We didn't know at the time, you know. That's when I took my dysentery. First illness I ever had, you know. So two or three years in a hell of a state. So we're shoved up to this big hut known as the Death Hut. Once you got with this hut, you knew you weren't coming back out there, you know. You lay a platform and you as you moved down to this canopy, you knew that was curtains, you know. So they kept moving down and moving down. And Father Kenny would come up and say, come on, Coogan, you'll make it. A lot to go, you'll make it, a lot to go. He kept saying that to me, a lot to go, you know. I said, oh, Christ. But this time was just skin and bone. Skin and bone, dysentery, you know, and, and malnutrition. Couldn't eat nothing. Eventually, I got... Back out of that hut, doing it beside my mates. Oh, Christ, that was a different story. They keep me a wee bit extra rice to get me going, you know, because when we were sick, they didn't feed the sick, the Japs. The lads helped, but the comrades' shit was beyond a joke, you know, I can't even describe it. Near Kinkasaki was a copper mine, and despite the state he was in, Andy's comrades felt it was safer for him to be seen to be working. We'll follow the bogies, and you can shove it along, down towards the tipper, and you'll get an empty bogey and bring it up. And I could just manage this. And they filled the bogies, you know, with a copper, and went blind, which was common in that malnutrition. And they, for a week, it was maybe a fortnight, and I used to go down with the lads and hold on to their shoulder. And that's how I got the job of pushing the bloody bogies, you know. And another time, I got acid in my eyes. I was going crazy with this acid, and it's, the promotion lads got hold of me. Now, they were prisoners too, you know, and they held me tight. One dope my eyes up, and they started spitting into my eyes, spitting into my eyes to wash the acid out, you know. Things like that. Ken, the last Doc Sweeney there, he got crushed to death. Yeah, he came for plantation. We brought him up in a bag. Fucking crusher. Doc Sweeney, he died there. Andy survived Kinkasaki and was moved to Haito. There he realised that the healthiest looking prisoners were the ones who fed the animals. Animal food was still food. So he volunteered and thrived till an officer summoned him to the pigsty. And he punched to the pigs, you know. No good, no good. Christ, the three of them were looking like greyhounds. The three bloody greyhounds are not going to force rig for that thing. I was the biggest thief in the world. I can always remember the vintage crates of bananas and the bloody rats who run up over my shoulder. And I got bananas in here, you know, Ken, inside my shirt, you know, and a belt in it. Andy's Robin Hood adventures got bolder when he discovered that sweet potatoes for animal feet were to be had on the far side of a horse stall. And go over into the shed. There I was, but three or four bars of sweet potatoes all cooked. They fed the cattle with that. Christ, I stuffed myself, put as much stuff inside my shirt, and I got back up and out. I was all right as long as the horse was there. I got away that for a good while, you know. Next time I came back, the horse was away, but there was a young bull in it. Oh, the boys burst. The young bull in it. I said, oh, 
I could chance it, you know. And I looked through in the mirror. <laughs> I wasn't happy with the way it looking at me, you know. So I went to it, it was turned, it's back me, and I jumped up and got my foot on the top thing me. And I made a bridge over and I pulled myself sideways and got up and I can still feel the heat of that nostril in my legs. And I go over it as much as I could, put that S back in. And while I was doing this, we was standing looking at me, watching me all the time. Never took his eyes off me. And Tenko went, roll call. Oh, Christ, what am I going to do? You know, I must get out of here. And I'll miss me. And I've got all these tatties in here to sweep potatoes. I smashed up. And I went it, it's turned its back. And I jumped down and got my foot on its back. And one foot on the back and one foot onto the rail. And down, right flat foot, I went right out on the ground, you know. And if I'd been Japanese, I'd had, had it. I was so skint up. Bruised, everything skint, you know, and that. Back in the hut. If he'd been caught, he could have been killed. Such was the random brutality in Haito under Commander Tomeki. Meetings were regular events. Andy got one for supposedly stealing boots. Very occasionally, though, revenge tasted sweet. And the hammer for the Japanese, the mark's still there. I nearly lost this leg, you see. But I got a little tanking. They kept punching the face, you know. And every time this Japanese hurt me, this wee dog was bite me. His wee dog was biting me in the back of the leg, you know, and nipping me. About a week or so later, this Japanese sergeant came in looking for his wee dog. I couldn't find his dog. All over the camp looking for his dog. I got this rice in my bowl, you know, and a wee bit of vegetables and grease in the soup, you know. I said, Chris, that was great, you know. So, so, the American Chinese, it was a cook. Chris, that was good, he says. Toko, toko. I was out of his dog. <laughs> Done it up and made a stew for us. The wee dog was biting me. They got a lot of it and made a stew it for us. And the other was looking for his dog. Maybe they could find it. <laughs> oh, I wonder where his dog went. We ate it. This is Andy playing his movie. He learned a lot of the tunes in the camps, anything to keep morale going among dying men. Did you play tunes to remind you still at home? Oh, we sung songs to remind us at home. And we used to paint, but sometimes we did it, it was maybe cut ourselves, get blood for paint to make the portrait of gone but not forgotten on the wall, bacon and eggs and that right in the wall and fish suppers on that on the wall and things like that. And we used to get something to cut a wee, wee bit of blood. This lad was very artistic, you know. You had to have a sense of humour. I mean, you get two men standing there, like a couple of matchsticks, facing up to each other, right? This is it for a world's heavyweight championship, you know, and everybody laughing. And I say, God, you could have brought them down, you know, poor souls, you know. Uh, you didn't know who was next to go, that's true. Because a lot of the lads died off. Morale had gone. The morale had completely gone. Even when you did survive, a legacy of the time of starvation endured. Harry Duffus met two fellow Dundonians at the holding camp in Canada. One was an old gentleman who'd been a banker in Singapore. After we got home, I told my wife about him and we invited him for a meal. And of course my wife is a great cook and she had this meal and we had three children and we were all around the table and at the soup course my wife made soup and she had bread with it. The kids at that stage were quite wee. Some of them left their crusts. And when the wife came to clear the table, she said, where's the crusts? Never thinking. And guess where they were? In the ex-prisoners of war, the old boy's pocket. He put his hand in his pocket and pulled out the crusts. And he said, I vowed when I was eating snakes and sparrows and anything I could get my hands on that I would never waste a scrap of food. And I've got them here. And that's sad. A very big speedy there, right? And I, d I dug one grave there, twice. I dug them all grave in Haito. Suzuki man made me dig it. I can never forget that. I dug a grave for speedy. And I only got it down about 18 inches down. And Suzuki says, Sunda, finish. I said, no, more scores, more. But get out of it, started cursing me in Japanese, you know. I started digging more. We brought him over and put him down, and, and Suzuki went and kicked him in, you know. And I put the soil on top again and got big bricks, you know, to put on top of that again. That's all we could do. And just we're going to go in, and Suzuki, he said, Hachi, dig another grave. And we looked at the guy, 
Take another grave away with a wicked pastor. He said, Asheter, eat Sherry Hatchie. That was my grave in Wara. Someone else got Andy's grave in Haito, and the surviving remnant of the Lanarkshire Yeomanry was transported to Taipei, then in the freezing winter of 1944, to Mujiport in Japan. On arrival, they were told to sleep on the quayside. Charlie had got a kilt he had kept, and it was full of lice, but we covered ourselves with no lice beside Charlie, you know, and poor Charlie had everything he could ask for. He had berry, berry, he had malnutrition, he had everything. Charlie was a big man, about six feet two, but he was just a skeleton. We got down there, and I couldn't into Charlie for heat, so I couldn't have bare naked, and he started Charlie bare naked, and everybody was doing the same. And I came the next day, but Japanese turning up, with clapping, for everybody to get up, going to move. And now she come on, up you get, Charlie, up you get, up you get, up you get. Charlie never moved. I've been lying with a dead man all night. Oh, Christ. So I got his kilt. I got his kilt. I just took my kilt with him. It was full of lice. But I took the kilt anyway. And that belonged to Big Speedy, a lad I buried. That belonged to Speedy. song I remember, poor lads in his last legs. I went up to him in the sick bed, I said, come on Stan, give us the lights of home. No, you sing it Andy, the lights of home. I can see the lights of home, shining brightly o'er the foam. Beckon to me whilst I roam Away from lights of home I can see somebody there Loving eyes and silver hair I can see her nailed in prayer Beneath the lights of home <coughs> Poor old soul, he only died a week after that That was just a week before Nagasaki for the bomb drop. Yeah. Oh, that was really sad. And, and what about your Muthi? Did you play that in the camp as well? Well, I played at uh, this camp outside Nagasaki. And I played it, and the lads all started singing The Lowest Be in England. <laughs> they weren't allowed to sing Patriot songs by the Japanese. So I'm playing away. <laughs> and now the boys are singing their head off. Unfortunately, the sing-song had been noted and the cheerleader brought in front of the officer who had a request for him. He said, always be England, though. Well, it's severe punishment. I said, oh, I not understand. I'm Scots. Oh, when he seen his face, he went mad. He was trying to catch me. He was trying to catch me, not understand. I'm from Scotland. That's what saved me. Playing the Scottish card got him out of a tricky situation, but what actually saved him may well be traced back to the race with Wooderson at Ibrox. The scene is a routine inspection of the men's belongings by a young Japanese officer. I opened up my bag and put it out, you know, and he's going through it, having that pick and having a look to see it. And he comes across this picture of my mum and me and, and my brothers, and he takes another one, and that's the picture she in there. That race? At uh, Ibrox. Ibrox Park. So he looks at this, he's studying it, and he stood back, looked at me and says, Woodbot, because he couldn't even pronounce the man's name, but he knew him. I said, Ichiban, number one. Yeah. And he pointed to the lad in the front. Didn't know who that was. I said, that's me. He said, Ichirihachi. Well, that was my number, Japanese prisoner war. Ichirihachi. And he stood back and he calls the other two guards up. And he shows them this. He says, Ichirihachi. And he's pointing to me. And I'm, I'm, I'm just about six and a half stone. He says, Sunda. That meant rest, all finished. Put your stuff back again. I didn't put my stuff back. He put my stuff back for me, nice and gentle. And as he's putting it back, but he sends a dummy, dummy, dummy. War very, very bad. I said, ah, no good. He said, ah, dummy, dummy, dummy. The officer was an athlete himself, 
So for the first time, humanity was restored to a relationship between captive and captor. And when Andy next took a beating with bamboo canes, the same officer deliberately held back. Even more astonishing, he brought ointment for the wounds. They handed in a, a leaf with a lot of paste in it to rub my back sideways. I was all bruised, you see, with the sticks in my legs and that. So a, a week later, the same bloke comes again. He says, it's a reaction. Deutschland Sunder. The Germans were finished. Scotia Mati Nippon Sunder. Very shortly, Nippon can't carry on itself. It's a reaction, Cairo. Go home, Scotland. Maybe your father and mother. Not supposed to tell you this. With so many men's spirits giving up and dying, such news revived the will to pull through. From then on, they were all looking for signs of the end of the war. For Andy, it came with initial disappointment. One day, he saw ten Japanese planes leave as usual, and his hopes soared when he saw just two come back. Then they were dashed when at least another eight appeared on the horizon. Oh, Christ. Where are these bastards getting these planes from, you know? And so, as I came over, I looked up, and I said to the big Yankee, I said, Hey, planes, they've got stars on them. I said, Jesus Christ, they're our planes. Yanks was following the Japanese in, and they gave that bloody airport. We couldn't see it, but we knew it was getting hell, and they'd come right up and come away back and back in again, or giving that place pure hell, you know. There we was, and as they came down, this block must have got his eye on us, Nick. We were waving, 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 shooting, you know. The Japanese were getting scared, they were running beside us, the sheep at this time, you know, and the plane was come right down, right over the top of us, you know. Packet came down, maybe two or three packets, opening up and on it. Hold on, lads, we'll soon have you out of here. Oh, Christ, the morale went up. Oh, see the morale. I mean, there were men dying in that camp, just giving it up. They could have lasted, Ken. But the morale was there, and I was pretty sure I was going to get out of that camp, you know. We go back into the camp. I never got a morsel of food for four days. Once again, Andy rebelled. So a public beheading was staged with him as the victim. I was getting made a, an example, and they took his sword, you know, as, as if he's going to do me, like, you know. Well, you've heard of folks saying the fear of death. I know what the fear of death. When the water runs down your legs, and it, it goes like that, and, that, and it, now say goodbye to your friends and that, you know. This is shouting, they're all booing them and that. And it, it brought it down flat on my head and stunned me, and down I went. The only thing I remember was some of my lads picking me up, take me away. This was him enjoying himself. Despite the cruelties, Andy Coogan never fell into the racist trap of blaming all of the Japanese. In fact, in the last camp near Nagasaki, where he witnessed the devastating aftermath of the atomic bomb, he built relationships with the local people who also suffered at the hands of their soldiers. When the war was over, he felt sorry for old dog face of the home guard and the women of the village who had showed the prisoners human kindness when they could. I gave them old dog face boots and shoes, I gave them socks, I gave them clothes, I gave them everything and food and everything for old dog face, you know, and Yamaguchi got all the, she wanted anything they could take, they got that. I mean, I wasn't the only one that was doing this, all the lads was doing that. They no animosity towards the civilian people, and this they couldn't understand. A man's a man for all that. Before the war, Harry Duffus worked in a Dundee jute mill, and at a social event organised for the returning POWs at the camp on Vancouver Island, Harry came across his second Dundonian exile. While this dance was going on, on one occasion, I saw this chap dancing with a nurse. face was vaguely familiar, despite the fact he had no hair. He really was a poor-looking soul, but something said to me, that's Kenny Watson. Now, Kenny Watson was a tenter in Cairdys. Of course, by this time, I'm in Canadian uniform because it was much nicer than the British uniform. I said, you know me, Kenny? No, Sergeant Major. I said, well, you should know me. I paid you every week for about four or five years. And he looked at me again and he said, oh, Harry's office. And the tears started to flow. And his first words were, can you tell me anything about my wife? Now, it's unbelievable, but I had been speaking to her only one week before. She was now a clippy on the buses in Dundee, and she was telling me she had written to Kenny every week for the three and a half years and never had an reply. She didn't know whether he was alive or dead. 
Kenny, on the other hand, tells me he wrote every week or so when he was allowed to write, and he had never had a letter. So here they are. He's crying. I am almost crying because it was sad. And naturally, I looked after Kenny. I got him things he shouldn't have got, like shoes, and, and I looked after him pretty well. For Harry and Andy, a strong sense of knowing where they came from helped them through the bad times. In the good times since the war, Andy was awarded the British Empire Medal for services to athletics, continuing as a veteran champion and as a committed trainer of young athletes in Carnoustie, where he now lives. Athletics apart, Andy Coogan's other favourite sport is golf, and he's Will Kent as a caddy at Carnoustie. Asked if he would caddy for the Japanese ambassador, Andy said yes, and when the ambassador asked him where he had learned his Japanese, he replied diplomatically that he had learned it on holiday there. That is a journey he would only undertake for one purpose. I'll leave the last word to him. I'd only got to see my pal's grave, that's all, because I'll tell you one thing, I often wonder what happened to Big Speedy's grave, and another uh, blog that got mine. They can't hold hate against people. I forgive all these people now, but I just can't forget. I can't forget it. It's impossible, you can't forget it, you know. The programme was an Odyssey production for Radio Scotland.